screen? Yes. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, slideshow, play from styles. Mm -hmm, perfect. Does it look good? Yes, yes, perfect. Good. Okay, so I'll just start now. Yes, yes, the floor is yours. Very good. Hello, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure today to be talking about um, new works made by photographers in America in the past two years, um, contemporary American perspectives. My name is Pauline Vermar. I'm a French curator based in New York. Um, and here I have selected um, seven bodies of work that I thought were you know, representing the diversity of what has been produced here in the US um, since 2020. Um, and I will just go through them and present them and um, hopefully it will be engaging and inspiring and empowering for many of you. So the first project I wanted to present today is Matt Black's American Geography. Um, it is a very classic, um, project. And so I thought I would start with this because it's very much in the line of uh, really even 1930s documentary photography. Uh, Matt Black is a Magnum photographer. And um, when I was at Magnum until recently, I left Magnum two years ago to finish my PhD. But when I was working there, um, Matt and I worked very closely on this project. And it's a project that I think is incredibly important. So here is a text that introduces it. <clears throat> in 2013, Matt Black started exploring his home in California's rural central valley known as the Other California, where one third of the population lives in poverty. American Geography is a visual record of his six year, 100,000 mile journey, which chronicles the vulnerable conditions faced by a very large, though less known, less unknown part of America. Black and white photographs are accompanied by Black's own travelogue, uh, his diaries, a collection of observations, overheard conversations in diners and public transportation, menu prices, bus timetables, historical facts, and snippets from daily news reports. With this project, Black wanted to help Americans to stop unseeing themselves, which I think is an important um, expression um, that he's been using to explain why um, he embarked on this um, long journey. So his photographs were first, um, in fact, the series was first called uh, Geography of Poverty. He had based it on statistics, looking at the people who in America lived below 20% um, of poverty, uh, well, below the line of 20% of poverty. Um, and he first started with California, where he is, and then he went on a whole um, journey across America, took those photographs. Um, so he would originally work with the, with the press, um, with the American press and international press to, um, to, 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 to show the work and to try to um, alert consciousness. <clears throat> and then um, little by little, he thought that maybe something maybe more institutional in the sort of cultural sense would be also um, important. So to get out of the editorial world and to, um, and to, so he worked on this publication, American Geography. This is also when his titles changed from Geography of Poverty to American Geography, because he thought that American Geography was a more um, somehow all-encompassing way to describe his project. So this is the book that came out with Thames and Hudson last year. Um, and this is an example of how in the exhibition and in the book, the, the objects that he had collected uh, were rendered. So this is a collection that he had made um, of homeless people um, signs. Um, and so he's been collecting like this objects that had belonged to the homeless um, or not only the homeless. In fact, he's been working very closely to populations that had been victims of water pollution, for instance, and trying to, as a photographer um, and as an activist, really bring attention to them. Then he um, he created this magazine that's really a, a pop-up publication that would, as it unfolds, become 
uh, an exhibition. So that's a way to, if you go in schools, for instance, uh, a very easy way for teachers or educators and universities and everything to unfold the object and create their own exhibition in a room. So this object would unfold and you had the photographs in there. Um, because again, the idea of this work was really to talk about the subject, to, to make it a scene. And he also created, and I encourage you all to visit the website um, called Reading American Geography, where you have the maps. You see here in red lines, his travels across the US from 2014 to 2020, and a whole range of suggested readings and interviews and essays that um, are really a wonderful uh, resource for anyone interested in the subject. So it's really a project that was photographic, but also soci sociological, anthropological, um, and along the lines of Thomas Piketty, for instance, the economist, um, trying to raise awareness and try to really um, help make it more known that the crisis is as urgent as it is. So here we go to another kind of geography, Nona Faustin's White Shoes, um, a beautiful and important project that she made um, also in the last year. Um, so Nona Faustin, I met her when I was a curator at ICP and she was starting to work on this project. And I will read you once again an introduction. White Shoes is a collection of self-portraits taken in locations around New York that were central to the city's once pivotal and now largely obscured and unacknowledged involvement in the slave trade. Nona Faustin depicts herself as the sites of, at the site of slave auctions, burial grounds, slave-owning farms, and the coastal locations where slave ships docked, posing nude apart from a pair of white high-heeled shoes, documenting herself in places where history becomes tangible. Postin acts uh, as a conduit or receptor in solidarity with people whose names and memories have been lost, but are embedded in the land. Running throughout the images, the talismanic white shoes that give the series its name suggest the many adaptations to dominant white culture that were and are still demanded of people of color in America. And so Nona Faustin um, posed um, in the nude, in front of sites uh, such as this old Dutch farm in Brooklyn. Um, you can see around her um, waist are little white shoes as the symbol of her uh, project. And this is really like Matt Black and very differently, but still a way to map um, and to, to make visible traces of the past in the case of Nona Faustin of the past, of the American past, that is still run, not so much discussed. Um, the violence that was, um, that was lived, uh, experienced by Nona's own ancestors and so many African-Americans um, during slavery. And so she went on to pause with the white shoes um, in front of major sites, such as, um, that's the cover of the book on the left, such as uh, financial institutions like this one, um, um, nature, places where uh, slaves were working, um, Wall Street. So it's a lot about, of course, symbolism, but also embodiment, literal embodiment of the past. And Nona Faustin also act her own daughter to perform in her series. And this is her on the left, uh, again, surrounded by the white shoes and talking about also the idea of legacy and the hope that for the next generations, um, the generation of her own daughter, and, um, and then further down the line, this spell can be broken and equality can be found, justice can be found. Um, here, I would like to talk about Tomika's work um, that I found uh, very interesting. Also met Tomika at ICP when he was starting to work on the series. So that was around 2017. Uh, his series Ma is a series he's done with his mother, um, reading you the introduction text. Tomika weaves together self-portraits and classically bucolic landscapes punctuated by the traces of East Asian stories embedded in the topography of the American South. 
In this first major monograph coming out early 2023, uh, Tomika explores the highly personal psychogeography of his hometown Memphis, where his mother, fleeing Vietnam in the early uh, 1980s, settled along with his extended family. Throughout the work, his mother emerges as a recurring character, sometimes the subject of quiet photographic study, and in others, a collaborative muse. He says, I'm a cut of my mom. Every photograph I make of her is a half self-portrait. Kat challenges the cultural amnesia around Asian lives and experiences in recent American history. What is not said here also in a conversation that he and I and, um, had, and that he has, um, around his work is that um, he also talks indirectly about queer identity, a fact of his personality that his mom never quite acknowledged, but kind of knew. And so they have this whole conversation, untold conversation together through his work, um, because this is not a subject that they feel comfortable talking about, but somehow photography has been helping him and them really um, dialogue around his being an artist. And as you can see, uh, there's a playfulness um, around the way that Tomika represents himself in the photograph, sometimes as here, um, a sort of a mask more than a physicality, um, a cutout mask. Here it's a photograph of a photograph, um, viewing them together. The mirrors, the mother in the mirror. Um, a puzzle, which I, so this is all the, the ways in which Tomika um, finds way to express somehow um, the multiplicity of his being and the difficulty um, of feeling entirely one thing. And the puzzle is quite a playful, playful way, but also a very um, eloquent way of expressing that kind of malaise. Here again, playing with shapes and cutouts. And here, this is in fact part of a different uh, story that I wanted to also bring up here. Tomika was born in Memphis, which is the city of um, Elvis Presley. Um, and he recently, last um, this past year, um, had an, an event at the Memphis airport. Um, and Tomika uh, had this photograph, very large format photograph, uh, hanging at the airport. And somehow a bunch of um, people from Memphis thought that it was playing like a joke on Elvis Presley, when in fact it was not at all. It was a bit of a tribute and trying to insert his own identity into the myth. But so the photo was taken down from the airport and it became a big um, issue um, in the cultural world in which um, many people, well, called it censor as it was, the photo was taken down and um, insisted that it would be put up. And so the, the photo was put back up in the airport, but it was quite a sign of how still complicated the conversation around multiculturalism um, can be here in the US and how outside of big towns like New York, um, Tolerance and openness are not necessarily um, um, in place. Um, but anyway, so Tomika's work is very much like Nona's, uh, Nona Faustin's, um, talking about America and the traces of past and diversity and how does it all pan out in the contemporary world? Are, are we in a diverse society? How does it, how does it, um, how does it work for them at an individual level? Another project that I thought was interesting um, to show you today is Dina Templeton's What She Said, um, because it also revolved around the question of identity, but most uh, mostly her old self as a teenager. Um, here I'm reading you the text um, that introduced her book, What She Said, um, takes its title from a song by the Smiths a band from uh, an English band from the 80s that you might know. What she said was sad, but then all the rejection she's had to pretend to be happy could only be idiocy. 
The work originates in portraits Dina Templeton made on the streets of the US, Europe, Australia, and Russia, in which she captured women in their adolescence, punks and outcasts who ripped jeans and tight tattoos, and hairstyles stand as testament to this transitional moment in their lives as they navigate the intensity of teenage life. Templeton grew up in a different environment in the 80s. Um, she grew up actually in California, uh, but she recognized in them something of the universality of female adolescence as they struggled with similar disappointments and challenges she encountered as a young woman. The book combines modern, modern portraits that she's done uh, in the recent years with gig flyers and her own teenage journal entries from the mid to late 80s. And the result of series um, is a combination of those portraits that she's done in recent years, uh, such as this one, with her diary, uh, her diary from when she was a teenager, so when she was their age. And there's an identification at um, at stake here, which indeed makes her project um, ring very universal. Um, and very, very deep and very moving. Here, for instance, you have one entry um, of her diary on the right. Um, and uh, it's quite bold. It was quite bold of, Deanna, um, of Dina Templeton to, um, to use this very personal narrative in a sense, uh, you can't be more intimate that, than your own diary. But she really felt at that point, she was in her 40s, uh, something maybe was the right moment to actually talk about those years that were so hard for her and that are so hard on so many teenagers. So many young women suffer from the same difficulties, psychological, mental, uh, physical uh, difficulty, the fear of not being um, suited for their own environment. And so in a way, her book, um, Self-Harm, of course, um, she explains she has experienced and here she took photographs of a teenager who was um who had been cutting her arms and so probably the gesture of Dina Templeton in that book was also to offer somehow a way for young women teenagers and young women to feel like they are not alone that their experience um is in fact shared universally and that there is a way out um and especially with covid there's been so much um so much pain and um and anxiety um in teenagers and young people and i feel like maybe dina Temp uh, templeton felt in that moment a need to to be there to share her own story um not so much for herself but for the others which um, I encourage you all to see this book. It's a really beautiful one. Um, another project, uh, funny, I think, a funny project and quite provocative, Scum Manifesto by Justin Kurland, um, was inspired by Valerie Solanas's iconoclastic feminist tract, Scum Society for Cutting Up Men Manifesto. Scum Manifesto introduces us to photographer Justin Curland's Society for Cutting Up Men's Books. This volume presents a collection of collages Curland created by cutting up and reconfiguring photo books by male artists as she went through the process of purging her own library of roughly 150 books by straight white men that she said have mon monopolized the photographic canon. They include Stephen Shaw's American Surface, William Eggleston's Los Alamos, Larry Clark's Tulsa, Martin Parr's Think of England, Alexos Sleeping by the Mississippi, Brassai's Paris by Night, or Robert Frank's The Americans, all classics of photography by um, white men, I guess, is what was the what was the theme. Kerlin's ritual is restorative and loving. Each work is a reclamation of history a dismemberment of the patriarchy, a gender inversion of the usual terms of possession, and a modest attempt at offsetting a life of income disparity. She explained, I started out thinking it would be a punk act of destruction, but it is a reparative act rather than a destructive one. Um, and so as you can see here with the collages, um, beautiful collages um, that in the flesh were quite 
uh, stunning pieces. Um, they were shown here in the gallery this year in New York, in Brooklyn. And it was great. It was one of the shows that um, was the most popular and talked about uh, at the time. And so as you can see, they're very creative, but they do play with the idea of objectification of women um, or with the idea of, yes, what is the body, uh, who has the power. So this is very much the discourse of the time about patriarchy and white male. Um, this project would be the embodiment of what has been happening here in the US for the past few years, uh, really since COVID and later, and of course, Me Too and Black Lives Matter, the whole deconstruction of society and rejection of um, a white society, white male-led society. Here you can recognize Danny Lyon's work, bikers. Um, and as she says, I mean, this was a sum of the, she explained that she um, told all, each photographer that she was using books by, um, she told them all that she was using their work and some of them uh, were offended, some of them were amused, a few of them in fact contributed to it. Um, and it's an interesting, very much of its time uh, project um, that produced, in fact, the, the book is stunning. It's a very interesting object in and of itself. The collages are very much inspired also. I mean, the collage um, has been for women photographers, particularly Greta Stern, um, Toshiko uh, Okanoe, a Japanese um, collage maker in the 50s, or in this case, um, Justin Kurland, a way to talk about issues that had to do with society without being too frontal about it. So there's this sort of symbolic, very much like in Nana Faustin's work, the symbolic of um, what is a woman and what is, in this case, a queer woman, uh, what is her role in society, what is her place in society, what is her power in society. Those collages, I think, are actually um, quite attractive in and of, even in and of its in and of themselves. You can see also figures of actors, um, Steve McQueen, bottom left, um, Rita Kahlo as the empowering force. And so here I take you to another project. Uh, this one by Diana Marcosian called Santa Barbara. Uh, that came out also in the past two years. Um, Diana Markosian was born um, in Russia, in Armenia. And um, as she explains, when I was seven years old, living with my family in Moscow, my mother woke, up, uh, woke me up in the middle of the night and said we were going on a trip. The year was 1996. The Soviet Union had long collapsed, and by then, so had my family. We left without saying goodbye to my father and the next day landed in the new world, America. Inspired by the 1980s American soap opera Santa Barbara, my mother placed an advertisement through a Russian agency in search of a man who could help her come to America. She was 35. We arrived to California, specifically the town of Santa Barbara, and were met by an older man who would soon become her husband and take the place of my own father. And this is where the story begins, the idea of touching something that felt untouchable. And so with this project, um, Diana Marcosian, who is now based in New York, um, wanted to create a fiction from her own um, life. Um, so to recreate what had happened to her and to sort of replay, to understand it better, and also to create bridges of communications between her and her mother, who still lives in California, and her father, who lives in Armenia. And so she wrote a script, and she, in fact, collaborated with people who worked in the industry of cinema to create a genuine, a really solid script that she sent to her mother, that she sent to her father um, and brother, and to have them communicate, really, it was a way for them all, almost like family therapy, but only Diana really wanted it. The, the, the family kind of had to, um, to, to play with her, in a sense. Um, and so she worked on the film. She worked on the book. This is the book that came out with Aperture. Um, and she's now working on a TV show, actually, um, a TV series that is going to be talking about her life as well. And so here you can see a combination. So this is a photograph 
taken on the shoot of the movie that she made that was shown at SF MoMA at ICP. And here is the actor playing her uh, stepdad. And here is the woman who's playing her mother. And so she reenacted the scene of the wedding in Santa Barbara. And here you have photographs um, of on the left, um, the actor, the actress who played um, her mom um, on the right. And so these are also, and you don't know what is fiction and what, what is reality. For instance, on the right, it's the script. The Polaroid is a photo of her fake mom and fake dad. But on the left is a photo of um, her mom. Um, so the letter in yellow here, this Dear Svetlana, is... Um, is a letter written by Eli, um, um, who so he became the stepfather. And so you have in the book and in the film all these combinations of fiction and reality. And so you kind of navigate uh, in in it all with a sense of being in her private, in Diana Marcosian's private universe, and in the sense also in the fiction that is removed from her. Um, and so she tried to recreate um, the world in which she grew up, um, which was not easy to do. Uh, but so again, this was a big team working with her, trying to replicate um, the environment in Moscow, the apartment, the objects. And to make it uh, at the same time um, artistic and um, psychological. So it was this sort of revisiting that had to be in her own style, she's an incredibly talented photographer and artist and portraitist. And so this is the actor playing her mom with the kid playing her um, as a child. But this is a photograph of her real father and her real self as a child growing up. In fact, Diana Marcosian's first project, uh, the one that uh, really brought her to um, the attention of the world was a project about her father who had been cut out from all the family albums um, when she grew up. So growing up, she would turn the pages of family albums um, and never see him because the mom had cut him out of the photos. And so she decided when she became an adult to go see him again and uh, create a portrait of her father. Um, this I wanted to end um, on um, something a little more, um, not so much not personal or not political, but certainly something a little more peaceful. And um, yes, there's a lot of serenity in this project, as you will see. As he puts it, Langar, a lyrical series of images made as a means of exploring escape, home, nature, and tranquility. And this is a project I wanted to end with because um, there has been, I mean, as you can see, all the projects that I presented to you today had to do with politics and identity and identity politics and all sorts of projects that were um, quite... Um, you know, not hostile, but there was something in there that was antagonistic uh, and a need of recognition and a need of expression and a need of revisiting and bring it to light. This project uh, by this young American photographer, Donovan Smallwood, for me is the kind of project that is also needed when looking at photography. And it is um, images that are more contemplative, um, that are not necessarily with a message, even though in this case, it deals with um, African-Americans um, in Central Park. So you can also, of course, see layers of um, politics and racial justice and um, all of those um, narratives that of course are part of it. But what really moved me with this project uh, when I first saw it was the peaceful nature of, uh, of these portraits. Um, so Donovan Smallwood spent uh, during COVID and right after COVID quite some time in Central Park taking portraits outside was okay and taking portraits of strangers um, that paused in this most beautiful natural way um, and the project is called Langer 
Um, and there is a sense also with nature, I mean, looking at those photographs, one really grasps the need, and especially during and after COVID, the need for nature. Um, that was quite universal, uh, but so of course, in the context of contemporary, contemporary American photography as well, um, what is needed and what can photography bring to the viewers and to the photographers themselves to help um, soothe, soothe us all. Um, and I feel like this, like this photograph, for instance, taken <clears throat> in one of the ponds of Central Park with the sky reflection in the water is for me really, a, it's, an import, it's as important as um, anything else political because it, it does um, play a soothing role that the arts should. Um, and so Donovan Smallwood took this, made this series of, of um, portraits and they're all, as you can see, in very um, subtle nuances of gray, which is also perhaps what brings such a peaceful feeling to them. Um, and there's a very natural flow uh, between the humans that he photographs and nature that he photographs. Um, which again is seems very simple and and um, uh, but it's it's not. I think that there's something quite remarkable in his uh, way of going back and forth um, between the two. Um, and um, yes, and so that's why I wanted to end with this this project because I thought this was something to. Um, to think about, you know, what is photography? Um, why are we taking photographs and why are we looking at photographs? And there's all of these projects for me, all of these six projects reflect the need um, for photography in our societies in a way that um, perhaps more now than it was in the 30s or 40s, we really need um, photography to act as um, as a link between communities, between the nature, between nature and, and humankind. Um, and so photography in all those projects for me encapsulates the way in which photographers and photography have been playing um, an important role in a time of crisis that we've been going through. What kinds of projects can we uh, produce to make it a little better for ourselves and for the world. And on that, um, I wish you um, a lovely uh, end of year and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you so much.